Hello and welcome to the Erlang Solutions Monthly Webinar. My name is Vladimir Milicic and I'm the Solutions Director here at Erlang Solutions. Today's webinar represents a continuation of a series of webinars we have been organizing across topics of interest in the world of Erlang and dealing with solutions based on the Erlang programming language. Specifically today we will talk about the creation of the Whisper application by Inaka, uh, which is an Erlang Solutions company. Whisper, as we all know, is the largest anonymous social network and Inaka worked with Whisper to build from the ground up a highly scalable and massively concurrent application in Erlang. Now most of us are aware how efficient Erlang is in prototyping and product development and the Whisper application is yet another testament to that fact. The application was created by Inaka through use of Erlang in just three months. As with any live event, please excuse any technical issues that we may face today, but to start by telling you a bit about Erlang Solutions, we are a products and services oriented company completely devoted to the Erlang programming language. Since our founding in 1999, we have worked with organizations and individuals using Erlang, helping evolve the language and supporting people and businesses using it. Today we are just over 100 people across our offices in London, Stockholm, Krakow, Budapest, Seattle and most recently Buenos Aires and working on projects across the globe. We're really keen on creating value and competitive advantage for our customers across industries and through the unique features and characteristics of Erlang as a language and we're equally ambitious in developing Erlang based products and you'll know that some of those include the Mongoose IM messaging platform, the React distributed data store and our Wombat OAM monitoring and management technology for Erlang systems as well as other solutions applicable across sectors and problem areas where Erlang makes sense. I'm very pleased to say that our speaker today will be Chad Depu, the CTO at Whisper and the founder of Inaka. Chad uh, will elaborate on Whisper's technical infrastructure and the use of Erlang in building massively concurrent, highly available and scalable applications. Now please allow me to finish by saying you are very welcome to post questions throughout the duration of the webinar by using the chat facility on the webinar's interface. Our speaker Chad will answer as many questions as time allows at the end of the webinar. But if any questions do go unanswered, you're welcome to raise them via email using the following address, webinar at erlang-solutions.com. If you're interested in learning more about Erlang or wish to establish whether it could be a solution for the challenges your own business may be facing, by all means, please feel free to contact me directly. My email address will be displayed in one of the final slides of the presentation we will share with you today. The same goes for any other questions you may have. Feel free to contact. I would now like to hand over to Chad, who will be glad to start us off. Great. Thanks so much, Martin. Um, as he mentioned, I'm Chad DePue. I'm the CTO of Whisper and uh, founder of Anaka, which is recently part of Erlang Solutions. Um, we make end-to-end -end apps for startups and uh, media brands, and um, we focus on high-performance apps uh, a little bit like Whisper. So. Um, I started Anaka in 2010 in its current form with Martina Frears, who's the CEO of Anaka now. Um, and uh, we're um, uh, a team of 30 working on end-to-end -end applications, mostly iOS and Android apps, um, both native and HTML. And um, we do one thing that's different, which is you know, most of our apps are remote bootstrapped projects. So uh, the team is uh, typically remote. Uh, we work with uh, founders, often founders which are don't have a technical background, um, and we really focus on high performance apps uh, on iOS and Android, and we really focus on scalable server architectures, and often that involves Erlang. So, uh, as of August this year, we're part of Erlang Solutions, and we're super happy about that. Um, and what that really means is that instead of a team of 30, we now have uh, over 100 people that um, have a variety of skills across um, a bunch of different time zones. So um, I think the question is, uh, to start out, is what is Whisper? So when I think about uh, the easiest way to describe Whisper uh, is it's an anonymous social network. It allows users to talk about all the things that you, you would typically not want to say on Facebook or Twitter. Um, it's very visual um, and character limited. Um, I think the easiest way to describe it is to show a few. And actually, it's funny. This is a slide from uh, the original version of the app, and I'll show a, a slightly newer version. But um, 
I, I thought it was interesting to show sort of the, the, the way it's evolved. So um, it's uh, uh, essentially a, almost like a postcard and uh, was um, inspired to some extent by the um, uh, by Post Secret, which was a uh, anonymous uh, art project, if you will, where people could mail postcards and they would be published on the web. So that was sort of the spiritual uh, uh, inspiration for Whisper. Um, and Whisper took off. Uh, we launched back in April of 2012, um, and uh, it really took off from there. So you can kind of see the evolution of it. Um, the on the left is uh, the old size thumbnails, and then the uh, the right is sort of the new, newer, uh, more full size. So people talk about things they wouldn't always talk about on Facebook or or uh, Twitter or uh, more public forum, Google Plus, where you have your name associated with it. But uh, it's uh, a moderated and and curated place so that it's a safe community and it's uh, often very confessional. And uh, people really find that it's a, um, a safe place for them to talk about things that you know maybe they don't really want to have their name associated with. So um, it's a uh, top 20 social network. Um, I really can't talk much about total number of users, but I can say that um, you know we have uh, many, many millions of users and billions and billions of Whisper views per month. Um, so we're talking about the story of Whisper, and so uh, this is going to be technical uh, to some extent, and I'm going to assume uh, there's a bit of knowledge about Erlang, but I'm not going to assume that you are sold on using Erlang for your project. So think of it as um, I'm assuming you don't have a lot of knowledge. I'll talk through some things. I don't. I won't assume you'll understand everything, but I can um, maybe talk a bit above the level of your Erlang understanding. And that way, you can come back later and watch it and, and sort of um, put the pieces together. So, um, so we're going to talk about story of Whisper in sort of five uh, snapshots. Um, we're going to cover uh, the story of Whisper, um, why we chose Erlang OTP, why we chose to, um, how we use distributed Erlang, some of the tools that makes Erlang great. And then sort of a brief note on training and hiring Erlang developers. Um, and this is from my perspective as somebody who has built a consulting company and somebody who is running a technical team as well. So, um, uh, so yeah, so let's go from there. So um, I think the first part of, this, of uh, the, the story is sort of like, you know, why do we use Erlang versus something else? So um, just to, to recap sort of what we did, we started in the beginning of 2012. We had two client developers, two server developers. Um, we went uh, from end to end three months. Um, and our founders are not what they would consider uh, technical co-founders. In other words, they were not coming to the table saying, hey, we're going to help code on this project. Um, they were expecting us to take that piece of the, of the puzzle. Um, and eventually, we built the app and handed it off to a team at uh, Whisper, which is you know, doing the day-to-day -day work now. So uh, the original app was iOS only, um, you know, full of RESTful interfaces, um, had a socket for doing some background administration tasks, um, you know, used uploaded images, um, and used uh, Erlang and React, and then um, eventually switched to MySQL later, Elasticsearch and Cassandra as features changed and as the app evolved. So. Um, I think the, the first question, and this is not related to Erlang at all, it's just sort of like what made Whisper work? And I think um, this is something that as a, a consultant building apps, I often people often ask me, how do I make an, a successful app? And I think um, there are a couple of things that every single app project must, must do. And I think um, the ones that I've seen that are successful always do these things. One is they pick a limited feature set to start. Um, and this has you know, nothing to do with technology. This is about the actual thing you're building. Um, the next is they do rapid experimentation in terms of that feature set to get product market fit. Uh, the next is they have um, typically focus on one device, not two at the same time, because or one platform, uh, so they can get those features right and figure them out before they actually duplicate all their mistakes on every platform. They don't spend a lot of time on settings. They just launch something that's sort of, um, you know, um, uh, designed for the user to work in a certain way, and they don't give the user a lot of choice. Um, and it's always built on a platform that can scale quickly. So um, that comes back to sort of why we at, we chose Erlang. And um, you know, I'm going to walk you through our thoughts at the time. So I think at the time, um, I guess now I could give you a very nuanced description in technical terms of uh, the Erlang VM and how per-process garbage collection works and how 
uh, versus the way the JVM does garbage collection and I could talk about supervisors and I can talk about all these sort of things about Erlang that make it great um, the way the multitasking model works and but the thing is I realized that there are a lot of talks on uh, the webinars on YouTube and on the Erlang Solutions site that can cover a lot of those details so I'm going to talk a bit more about just sort of our more high-level uh, decision-making process uh, really briefly so the first question was why don't we use Java and uh, I think what we said was, you know, um, when I look at, and I've done a lot of Java, I've built a lot of projects in Java over the years. Um, in Java, uh, things are often more cumbersome. Server-to-server uh, -server communications are often more complex, so you have to use sockets, and you don't have a lot of um, uh, tools that you can use to make that simple. It's gotten easier with things like Akka, but um, it's definitely not something that out of the box gives you a lot of those tools. Um, clustering uh, along the lines of what you get in Erlang is not generally working without paying a lot of money for a, a custom clustering solution. Um, there's no uh, REPL that allows you to um, you know, work in the shell during runtime, and Java is very verbose. And I've had a lot of experiences where I was sort of burned by Java, and I said, you know, what, I don't, I just don't want to do this again. So um, I think we also compared uh, Erlang to Ruby and, and Rails, and we said, you know. Uh, Ruby's great for web apps. It's uh, there's some great features in terms of rapidly prototyping. In fact, uh, for Whisper, we actually still use Rails for the backend admin tool because it's it's really nice to just rapidly develop um, uh, web UI for that uses you know HTTP interface into the Erlang API. Um, but it's a little bit slow um, and it uh, doesn't give you some of the things that um, make Erlang great in terms of static analysis, in terms of some of the runtime tools, um, and uh, often gems can be difficult in terms of uh, code management. Um, I think also we looked at Python and Node and Go. Um, we sort of made a little chart at one point and said, okay, you know, and it didn't look quite like this. This is kind of my memory of it, but it's sort of like, okay, what do we need? We need, um, it'd be nice to have a REPL. It'd be nice to have um, some of this cross-server communication. Um, we knew that probably some of the, of the databases we would use, uh, potentially Jabber, for instance, for um, IM, and then uh, React, we were, were in Erlang, so we thought there would be some nice um, interop there. Um, and the one thing we were like, you know, this is not great, is Erlang's sort of web story is not as good. You can do anything. It's HTTP. It doesn't have the killer web framework. And so um, at the time, that was a negative. Um, I think um, the thing is, though, we're a very heavy volume messaging app, or we felt like we would be. We would have API endpoints for the clients, uh, iOS and Android clients. Um, they would be um, essentially uh, need some real-time moderation and some ability to, to delete content uh, via this background socket. And so it felt like Erlang was a good fit. So, um, and I think that there's one little detail that grid is a little bit misleading because I think you know of Erlang as this whole platform and OTP giving all these services. And I think you know. Um, Maybe it's not misleading, but I think what we we looked at was, you know, I'm gonna have to build some of this stuff from scratch in Go or Node, whereas a lot of this stuff comes for free in Erlang because it's part of the platform. So anyway, let's jump into the architecture of Whisper. Um, we're on Erlang 17 now. I think we launched on 14. Um, it's uh, a fairly typical architecture for an Erlang web API. Um, we used. Um, uh, um, we did not use Cowboy. We actually um, used MochiWeb, which is an uh, Erlang web framework or web um, server. Um, we use um, Cassandra for a lot of our data store now. Um, we use MySQL for, for some data as well. Um, Redis for some temporary caching, although over time it's uh, slowly fit being replaced because it's most it's in some ways a single point of failure. I um, mean, we use a lot of Elasticsearch for searching. So. Originally, we launched, you know, this, the, before we added a lot of those databases, we had a couple of HA proxy servers, a couple of MySQL servers, um, some Erlang servers, and before we'd done a lot of optimization, and then um, a bit of Elastic. Um, at this point, we have a lot of servers, and I think this is probably a little bit behind, um, but, you know, we have um, uh, about 20 to 30 Erlang servers and a number of Elastics and Cassandras and Redis's. So, um, one thing that's really nice, though, is that I, I don't really think a lot about the number of servers we have in terms of, um, uh, you know, I mean, we think a lot about it in terms of efficiency. We don't think about it in terms of can we add more because 
the way the system is set up, OTP allows us to scale in many ways horizontally because we can just add um, more servers and we don't really need to worry about where processes are running. So, um, you know, what I want to do is talk a bit about um, what, how does it do that and what are the ways in which that becomes really easy for us to build scalable systems. And so, um, you know, data from those databases needs to get to those machines somehow. And so that will, um, is really where distributed Erlang comes in. And so I want to talk a bit about, um, you know, where we have a cluster of Erlang nodes. Um, and I want to be, you know, make a quick statement now. In Erlang, we don't typically talk about servers. We talk about nodes. So an Erlang node is an Erlang VM running on a server. It could be running, you could run multiple nodes on one server. You could run one on one server. Um, it sort of depends on your typical situation and what your workload is. Some people like to run more than one node on a server. Um, some people don't. Sometimes it's better, sometimes it's not. It kind of depends. But it doesn't really matter for our purposes. So um, let's take a quick example of what it would look like to build some of these caching services that we've built for Whisper on top of uh, Erlang, on Erlang OTP. So in Whisper, we have sort of three main feeds, and we have thousands of sub feeds. So uh, um, the, uh, in Whisper, a main feed would be uh, something like a popular feed or the latest feed. Um, there's a nearby as well, which we'll talk about separately in a minute. And uh, so what we have with popular and latest are these are feeds of whispers. And we need to be able to um, actually have those available in any one of those numerous Erlang servers, right? So if you think about it, what we need to do is we need to build some sort of layer that, that actually either retrieves that data from the database every time, which could be kind of slow, um, or we need to cache that on the individual servers. And so with the popular and latest, um, if you think about it, it's sort of a, um, we have a lot of feeds that are very long tail. So if, if I go and look at um, what are the, um, you know, people saying about, um, uh, you know, any particular topic, um, there could only be a few people on that particular topic, but if I look at what people are, uh, how many people are actually looking at the latest feed or the popular feed, there could be a lot. So um, that's the kind of feed you don't want to have to go query from some database every time. It's going to be, you know, vastly too slow if you're getting thousands of requests per second. So we use a gen server, which is a, a, a construct in Erlang OTP that allows us to um, uh, basically cache, you know, we can use it for anything, but in this case we're using it to cache uh, the data from the popular and latest feeds. So um, in this case, the things we want to cache are um, a subset of the users, the, the hearts, and the replies for these whispers. And so um, what we want to do is build a cache uh, that, that holds that data locally and it broadcasts it to other nodes. So in this case, we use an LRU cache. And uh, it, uh, it actually will um, keep the, you know, the latest information in the cache and it will purge out the stuff that becomes older over time. So for instance, uh, if something becomes popular, maybe it sits in the popular queue for a few hours depending on whether it gets a lot of up or a lot of hearts um, and then it'll eventually fade out. So, but if something becomes popular, it becomes popular because it's hearted and because it's um, replied to. And so as that happens, we want to actually broadcast uh, that local new heart or that local new um, reply to the other nodes. So um, each server is running a gen server and we use this, this um, uh, module in Erlang that's built into the platform called PG2 to get a list of the other servers, uh, uh, the other actual, sorry, the other processes in Erlang that are running the same gen server cache. So what that allows us to do is it allows us to um, say, okay, I have a new heart or a new reply. I can uh, go get the um, all the other processes across all the servers in my cluster that are also serving up this cache data, and I can broadcast to them. So uh, here's a quick code sample. Um, so I'll say, you know, this is actually not, this is like a sort of pseudo code version or simplified version of what we're doing. I can say, uh, here's an LRU uh, list which we create with it holds a certain number of cache items. Whenever I create that, um, I can join a group in PG2. So PG2 allows us to, to create groups of processes. 
and I can say, okay, well, hey, you know, this is in my cash uh, group, and say, hey, PG2, join me under the cash group name, uh, and and put myself in. Self is the process ID of my of my own process, and I can return in my Gen server some state, which um, you know hangs on to my cash. And so, as I um, uh, am getting new events coming in, I actually get um, an update cache message that comes into that gen server, and I can actually say, um, if I'm on the server where that event occurs, I can create the message, I go get all of the members in my group, and I use um, a, uh, a list comprehension, and I say, okay, for all the, the actual members of all the, for all the processes that are actually running caches, send them, that exclamation point means send them a message, send them the message above, which is this tuple, update cache, um, I, process, I pass in my process ID and I pass in the data I want to change. So I say, for all the processes in my group, send them this message, but don't send them the message if it's myself. So in other words, um, I can in one line say, send this message to every, every server, but don't send it to myself so I don't have to worry about um, infinitely recursing because I'm updating myself over and over. So literally, what would be hundreds and hundreds of lines of retry code and logic and, and uh, you know, thinking through socket connection cases and registries and all the stuff you have to do in Java, um, it, you know, or any any other language that doesn't have these constructs is literally one line of code. This is the kind of thing that, as you build a bigger system, you just you you want to cry tears of joy because it's one line of code and you can do so much so quickly. So um, in practice, what, that, what does that look like? A heart comes in to an Erlang node. PG2 um, has the the actual process ID on all the other servers. Um, we write that to disk. RDS is like the MySQL database. Um, in this case, it, it, at this point, it might go to some other databases too. But um, it gets written to the database, but it also updates the other servers. So think of it as almost like a distributed write log, if you will. Um, so that's that's how we handle the, the simple feeds. Um, I think as um, you, if you think about some of the types of caching and the types of data access that we have, uh, when you think about nearby, it's a little bit different. So um, nearby, you need to to actually um, think about all the the whispers and all the content that's in a certain area, and you want to pull older content for for a, a certain area that has less content. You want to pull only the very latest content for a very heavily populated area, um, and so we actually need to to think of a slightly different model. So. In this case, Erlang is still incredibly powerful because it allows us to do some really interesting stuff around uh, caching as well. Um, so I picked a random area um, in uh, the U.S. I picked uh, Nashville, Tennessee, um, and I said, okay, you know, um, I'm going to walk through sort of how we think about storing this data. So um, if you think about we're actually caching in three dimensions, you've got the, the two dimensions of the actual locations of the content, and then in the... Um, the third dimension is time. So you want to actually travel back in, uh, you want to in increase your range as you search for whispers to show, um, but you also want to expand the time window because in some cases maybe uh, you don't have as many items in a very rural area. So, um, you know, these, these could be old um, or, you know, uh, another area, I don't have a pointer here to show, but like in a certain area you might find lots and so you don't actually need to expand the radius as much. So how does Erlang help with this? Well, it's just to build this sort of tagged model of the world where we can actually tag these, um, uh, these places with zip codes or census blocks or um, we could use shape files to make very specific uh, geographies like say on campus at a college or a university. Um, so in this case, we, we use um, geohashes and we, we um, I don't know if you're familiar with geohashes, but you can break the world into these um, base 32 representation of a lat long, um, and it's a really simple way of um, dividing up the globe. So I know I have the globe into these tags. Um, I use zip codes in this case just to make it simple. Um, we, they become tags in the database. Um, they're stored in ETS, which is the Erlang term service, which allows us to store, um, uh, it's essentially a, a, a shared database that's running on each Erlang node. Um, and we store these in ETS. So I can do something like um, uh, when a new whisper comes in, I can use another OTP construct called gen event, which is essentially a very um, 
general and, and easy to use uh, means of subscribing to uh, a stream of events. And I can um, store uh, new wizards that come in, look up their lat, lat long, uh, do some fuzzy um, sort of obfuscation of the exact location, and then store it in our um, location database. So as new whispers are coming in, these are streamed into these Erlang processes, which are essentially representing each of these geographies. So if you think about it, imagine that you know on campus you might have um, a few dozen of these uh, geographies, all of which are interested in this new piece of content. So each one of those has an actual Erlang process. Um, thousands of which are all over the world running on our servers, and each one of which is listening for new events. So this concept of new contents coming in, and um, I can actually you know, stream that and then actually listen and store that in the proper Erlang process and the proper um, ETS table for uh, that geography, it's incredibly simple to do um, a very, very powerful sort of uh, publish-subscribe system uh, that's allowing us to represent the geography of the entire world and to show whispers in that area. So I can you know, say, okay, if someone says, give me the nearby for uh, this area, I figure out which uh, tags should actually um, show, this, uh, should show this content. I can go to those tags and say, hey, um, okay, do I have enough? No, expand my radius, get a few more results. And uh, we sort of put a little bit of intentional randomness to it so it feels fresh and different each time. Um, but we also need to be deterministic about it because we need to be able to page through the results. And so um, we can, uh, as we expand out, um, grab all these results and then we can actually render them and show them to the client. So, um, you know, we used to have a, um, do all this actually just uh, by hitting um, Elasticsearch directly. And we had a pretty significant load issue. I, um, I have an old graph and it, I, I apologize for the lack of units. It, um, uh, it doesn't really give you a, a exact ref, uh, representation of the of the difference, but it was about a 5x drop. And so building this sort of nearby caching system dropped our load by about, yeah, by about five times, maybe a little bit more. And the other thing is it made it a lot more stable. So the load is a lot more consistent because we're essentially listening to and handling these events as they come in um, versus doing a massive elastic search query across the entire space of whispers on uh, every uh, every request and I apologize for the lack of units on that graph um, so um, that was actually sort of version one of our nearby cache um, to go in a little bit more detail we actually recently switched to an R tree model which allows us to be a little bit more granular about how uh, we actually pull those whispers in um, and so we've done some interesting stuff around that and it's a little bit I, I don't think it would really fit to go into that for this talk but um, uh, suffice it to say, we've been iterating on that as the product gets bigger, and um, you know, it's but this this model of of sort of runtime using Gen servers broadcasting that across the nodes as whispers come in, listening to these events um, is incredibly scalable, and it's very very powerful. So, um, and also to be clear, we still use Elasticsearch because we read all that data in from Elastic when a server boots up. So. If you think about it, um, I don't really want to be in the in the business of rebuilding my own Elasticsearch that database. It doesn't really make sense. At the same time, um, you know, Elastic has uh, great use cases in terms of, um, or, or it, it's very powerful in terms of returning results for uh, nearby queries um, and for um, geo geo tagged and you know data. But it's we can do better than Elastic in terms of knowing our exact use case and how we need to retrieve from it. So we use it as a, as a primary store, um, but we're listening to new data and we're, and we're you know, um, pulling that data into the cache as we start the server. So, um, uh, yeah, so I think, you know, as after a region's running, we don't need to requery. Um, so there's one more type of caching I want to talk about. And so this is a little bit um, of a different model, but this is kind of a similar, shows you another way in which we use uh, Erlang OTP. Um, we want to also cache whispers and retrieve whispers based on how often they're accessed. So we have these feeds of whispers. So something might be Oscars 2014 or something like that. That might be a popular topic. There definitely is a use case for whisper where people use it almost like a second screen app and they're talking about something that's happening in real time. Um, so as whispers are coming in on that topic, we're going to see a lot of people searching on that query. And 
again, that's going to go into Elasticsearch or it's going to go into Cassandra to go pull off of a particular topic that we've um, fanned out our whispers into. And so what we wanted to do was build a generic system. At the end of the day, I think we have about 15 different types of data that we want to cache in some way. So we want to build a system that allows us to generically cache, but we want it to uh, detect when we need it. So I don't want to I don't want to catch every piece of data. I've got almost a billion whispers and all this amount of you know this massive amount of data. How do I actually um, uh, you know distribute um, this cache? But how do I not load everything I need? So I built this this cache called Fireman, which uh, I guess somewhat of an inside joke uh, puts out fires. Um, and Fireman allows us to implement a behavior, which is um, a little bit like an interface in a, in other languages but it allows us to build an Erlang module that says I've implemented this behavior and um, I, uh, with that module, if I implement that behavior, then um, Fireman can um, expect that this module will respond to certain method calls. So I can um, implement a behavior and I can create a, uh, anything that can return a paged query can be cached. So that allows us to not really think about caching anymore in terms of like what I'm, you know, how it actually is happening internally and how it's being moved around. It allows us to focus our testing and our um, you know, reliability around getting this one cache system really, really solid. So, um, so there's sort of a two modes to it. One is a manual or an automated. Uh, one is manual, one's automated. So um, in the manual mode, I can say, hey, Fireman, activate. And for example, we have a cache around uh, related feeds. So I can go into the app and I can, uh, if I create a whisper, it'll actually say, um, oh, you know, this is, that's, you know, thanks for your whisper, here's some other whispers that are kind of like this one. And um, depending on the on the whisper, depending on the subject, that can be expensive. So in other words, if, if everyone's talking about a current event, that might be the kind of query that we want to cache. So um, you could say, hey, I want to cache this. Uh, here is, uh, you know, the ID of the feed I want to cache. Here's how long. The duration is a constant that we can set. Um, and then you can say true or false whether you want to broadcast that to all your nodes. So just one line of code, boom, you're, you're, you know, you're returning this cache across the entire system. Um, there's another way to do it, which is essentially I can say, hey, Fireman, just give me this data. Here's the module. Here's the key I want. Here's the page I'm on. Here's how many I want to return. So this is like more of a read-through model where Fireman will actually say, uh, okay, great, I'll go get this data. But when it does it, it actually um, keeps track of the actual amount of time that we, um, or, or sorry, the number of accesses per second that are being, that are being requested for that exact cache key. So I'm going to walk through this code really quick. So we say, um, in the ETS, we do an ETS lookup that says, hey, do we have um, uh, for this table, which is the, the uh, the name of this cache uh, for this key. Do we have anything in here? And if it doesn't have anything, it'll just insert a new key that says, okay, this is my first request starting now. I cut out the top and the bottom of this code or the top of this code. So it's a couple of these variables were defined above it, but it wasn't quite room. Um, but now it's just the current time. The TID is the name of the ETS table. And in this case, it would be um, like, for instance, with related, it would be the fireman cache for related. Um, and then if we do have something, we get back uh, um, a tuple that's the key, the average, um, and then the count, and then the last time we accessed that. So then we recalculate the accesses per second, and then we re-restore, re based on that, on that uh, cache key, the value back in ETS. Now elsewhere, when we do that, we can say, are our accesses per second high enough that we should actually flip on cache mode, or should we leave it off? So in this case, you can essentially think of anything I can fetch from the entire system, and pretty much everything in Whisper is a feed of Whispers. I can just use a couple of lines of code. I can say, uh, fireman fetch, and underneath that, it's actually going to flip on a caching mode and broadcast that cache to everyone as needed. Um, so there's a couple of things you know, down the road that we're going to add. Uh, we'd love to do more time series analysis. Right now, it's very basic how we uh, decide to cache. Um, currently, once we cache something, we never stop caching it, um, which we know how to do. We just haven't done it, um, and that's not a huge issue because you know we're constantly doing deploys, and we it, 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 you know caches get flushed sort of as the result of doing business. But it'd be nice to not have to think about that. 
And then, um, you know, we'd also love to change refresh interval. So once caching comes on, we essentially rerun that query every X seconds based on, um, you know, configurable settings. So we might say, hey, you know, there are less, there's a lot of traffic to this, we should be refreshing that every second versus, oh, there's not a lot, we should refresh it less often. So, um, summary, there's sort of three types of caches in our architecture, and these are three different ways of um, thinking about distributing data in Erlang and, um, and then thinking about the way in which you, you know, communicate across the network. So the three ways are by popularity, by location, and by request volume. And all three use ETS and they use a judicious amount of broadcasts. Um, because uh, you know cross node communication is so easy, distributed caching is very very easy. Now, one thing I'm going to give a couple caveats here, and this is uh, I'm going off off grid. I don't have a slide for this. Um, with um, Amazon, so most of our stuff is hosted at Amazon. We definitely have found you know we learned some tips and tricks, and we're going to publish this uh, soon on um, on the, probably the uh, Whisper blog, but I think it could also be a good uh, Anaka blog article as well. So we'll uh, figure out where we publish this, but it's a uh, um, uh, at least we'll link to it. So a lot of the issues we've had around um, using Amazon with um, Erlang are around um, the fact that the network is not as reliable on Amazon as we would like it to be. So um, definitely with um, a number of servers, you start to see things where maybe a server disappears for a few seconds and it comes back. Maybe you lose some, some packets. And um, what we found is we actually use a very special mode of broadcast called send no suspend whenever we broadcast um, in, um, in using Erlang. So if we say, hey, go send this message to another Erlang node, we always say send it but don't wait for a response. And the reason why we do that is um, if you are in your own network and you're on your own dedicated um, uh, NIC and you have maybe you know an outbound NIC for um, the web traffic and you have an internal um, network interface for the rest of the servers to communicate on their own backbone that uh, you can kind of you can sort of have a bit more assurance and, and, and actually maybe you, sh you shouldn't have more assurance but um, you, you can get away with assuming that the network's a bit more reliable um, Amazon is definitely uh, a difficult environment when you have a lot of Erlang nodes and so once we found that out um, We've made it a lot, you know, like using send no suspend. Um, it solved a lot of our sort of uh, difficult uh, issues around, uh, you know, Amazon network um, instability. So, so anyway, there we go. Um, I, I think you know that's a good example of some of the of the tools we use. I'm going to talk very very briefly about some of the runtime tools we use, um, and then I'm going to um, talk about hiring. We're going to wrap up. So, and have time for questions. So, runtime tools. I think. You know, this is not a confession. This is like actually a statement I'm a bit proud of. We've never used the Erlang debugger. You just don't need it. You can trace. You can look at um, call stacks. You can look at uh, crash dumps, um, and with some really nice tools. And you can just hop on the server in production and check things out in real time. You don't really need to debug. Um, and I think that's um, you know I remember um, at Microsoft one time we had a problem with a production system, and we you know just literally hooked up Visual C to the runtime, the one runtime web server or one of the servers and just started stepping through the debugger in you know real time to figure out what was going on. Um, and you know, I remember thinking I never want to do that again, you know. So um, one of the things I like is we don't have to do that in Erlang. There's a lot of tools. Um, so of those tools, what are the indispensable ones? Um, I think Epper is a is a set of tools that we use that gives us some really interesting stuff. It gives us things like DTOP, which allows us to um, almost like a top for Erlang. Uh, this is like a, a sort of um, Erlang runtime debugging for, for dummies. It's a good one to start with. Um, I think the one that's incredibly powerful is Redbug, which is just a simple wrapper around the built-in tracing um, uh, APIs that are in the actual runtime. So I can say uh, Redbug start, I can give it a process like a gen server, I can give it a module function um, and, a set, and an arity or a set of arguments, and it'll actually return to me on the console every single message going into or out of that process. So if I'm like, why is this, you know, gen server acting weird? What's making it crash? I can flip that on, have it run for 500 messages or 10 seconds, and it'll just dump to the console um, that, you know, set of messages. And it's really, really powerful. Um, and then Observer, which is a, a tool built into um, Erlang, 
I've never, we never use this in production, but it's nice when you're, you know, building a system. It gives you a visual view of your supervisors, and it's, it's very, very powerful. And then really the, the most important tool is the ability to connect to an Erlang remote shell. So um, we have a command. Uh, I can just type Amazon attach and give it a server from my desktop. Um, and assuming I am VPN and everything else, boom, I'm actually on that Erlang node. I can start looking around. I can do what I need to do to, to figure out how to debug a system. And that's incredibly, incredibly powerful. It allows us to look at things in real time. And, and um, I don't need to go add some logs, deploy something, check it out. I can just go in there, run time, um, and do it. Um, so, uh, and then lastly, um, I think, you know, I want to talk a bit about hiring and training. So, um, one of the concerns that people always have when they talk to me about Erlang, and I think it's a legitimate concern, um, is hiring and training. So, um, if you think about it out there, um, you know, there, there are a lot of people that know how to do some you know, Ruby and a Rails app. There are a lot of Python developers out there. Um, there are a ton of Java developers out there. There aren't as many Erlang developers, and it's growing. Um, but I saw this slide deck recently on Quora, uh, or a slide, and it's on a deck, and it, um, they were talking about this concept of, um, you know, a little bit of slope makes up for a lot of y-intercept. And so the, the, the whole idea was, um, and really anything, um, if you, um, you know, have something good uh, and you have some time, uh, you know, if you hire for a particular set of skills, like you can go find the best uh, Java developer out there uh, and, you know, great, they come in on day one and they have X skills. Um, that's great. But if the rate at which they learn is a, is a bit slow, well, over time, they're actually going to be far below somebody who had less skills coming in who just knows how to learn. And so I think, you know, if you're taking this approach to hiring, it really doesn't matter what language you hand them. And ironically, Erlang is such a simple language that you can pick it up very, very quickly. <clears throat> Excuse me. So um, you know, I can hire that Java developer with skills in X, or I can hire any developer and teach them skill Y. And so that's my philosophy always with hiring. And I always tell people, just don't be afraid to dive in. So you can just, you know, jump in and figure it out. Whisper, for instance. Um, has a number of developers and you know, a new developer comes in in two weeks they're productive and writing Erlang code and getting stuff done. Um, there are a ton of resources online, um, learning some Erlang, uh, YouTube videos, Erlang factory videos and the conferences themselves and it's really quite easy to just dive in. So um, that's you know pretty much it for the overview. I want to do a, a quick uh, conclusions. Um, you know, um, uh, you know there are a couple of things that are improving in Erlang that I didn't talk about, but I'm really excited about. Maps have been introduced, which um, cleans up some of the, the legacy records uh, syntax to some extent, uh, especially with newer code. Um, and also, frankly, uh, as I just mentioned, uh, as Erlang becomes more popular um, and becomes more mainstream, um, it just seems easier to, to jump in. So you go on Hacker News, and there's like a bunch of Erlang articles, uh, you know, uh, today on, uh, in fact, um, uh, Fred Hebert re released an um, amazing book on Erlang runtime debugging, and it's actually think about it like an advanced course on what I'm talking about with, with Epper and, and Redbook. So he's got a ton of tools that we've used a lot of those tools to debug runtime systems. That's that's on Hacker News. You know, um, for the last 24 hours, it's been on the t on the front page. So I think um, Erlang is becoming much more mainstream, and it seems easier and easier to dive in. Um, other things that are great about Erlang is OTP just forces you to make rational decisions about your architecture. Uh, supervisors help you build a system that can uh, survive uh, chaos and crashes. Um, hot softable code, which we use in, in um, I didn't get a chance to talk about, but in our in some of our uploader systems, which allow us to make changes to the code where the system never goes down. Um, attaching to nodes, as I mentioned, um, the broadcasting facilities, and then um, uh, and lastly the Erlang community. So, you know. Um, Quick mention of Elixir as well. Um, the um, you know Elixir is definitely bringing a bigger community in, um, and uh, you know the conferences are growing. Lots of big companies are using it, and people are publishing a lot of content. So bottom line is that uh, with Erlang Whisper has been able to move fast and scale, and I think that's really what anybody wants from uh, any platform. So um, we're very happy with uh, the decision and, and how it's gotten us to this point. Um, so that's pretty much it. Um, I'm going to leave it open for questions, and we can go from there. 
Thank you very much, Chad, and I'm sure that um, all the attendees of the webinar will join me in saying thank you. In, in fact, we've gotten a lot of messages that are sort of really just saying thanks for a great talk. So um, thank you for that again. And um, like I said at the beginning, um, the issue that we have is obviously um, that the webinar is time constrained, uh, and there's always a number of questions coming in. So we will try and answer as many as we can. So the first question for you, um, Chad, comes from uh, Julius, and Julius is asking, have you considered PHP when building Whisper? Yeah, uh, oh, sorry, can you repeat the question one more time? Uh, so Julius is asking, have you considered PHP when you started and when you were sort of building Whisper as an application? Oh yeah, sure. So, no, I mean, I think, you know, PHP actually, you know, it's, look, it's a, it's a obviously really, you know, uh, robust system and you can do a lot with it and, and people have built amazing things with it. Um, I've used it a lot in the past. Um, we didn't, I, I think partially, um, to be honest, I think there's a bit of a stigma when I when I do hiring to say, hey, we're a PHP shop. I think that's not uh, a selling point. Um, one of the things I think has been great um, about Ruby, for instance, is I think people look at some of the pain of Java and the configurations and all the stuff you have to do and all the like actual code you have to write and uh, it's um, tiring, and so Ruby is like I think an answer to that to some extent, which is hey, look, convention over configuration on Rails at least, and and write less code. Um, and I think Erlang in some ways is a similar answer to it. Um, I think there's some boilerplate with Erlang, but I think relative to the amount of code you'd have to write to build distributed systems, the boilerplate is quite small. And so I think um, you know. I guess maybe as I've gone through my career, as it goes on, I want to write as little code as possible. Um, and so I think we didn't look at it super closely. Thanks, Chad. I think that's uh, that's a great answer. Now, I'm a bit of a fan of React myself, so um, if you don't mind answering this particular question, uh, one of the members of our audience is asking, what was the deciding factor for you to sort of lose React in favor of Cassandra slash Elastic? Yeah, um, so I think like it's a great question, and and I think you know my opinion of React has really evolved over uh, the last couple of years. I think when we actually started with React, we just embraced it too early. Um, I think it wasn't quite ready for what we didn't, for what we wanted to do with it, um, and I think we weren't using it in the right way. So um, for instance, I think if we had gone back and used React now the way we're using Cassandra, it'd be fine. Um, with Cassandra, we're doing fan out um, so of all, all of the queries we need and, and just duplicating data in order to make sure that the runtime performance on reads is really, really good. Um, and I think it's pretty similar to the way other folks are using Cassandra. Um, I think um, with React we were thinking, hey, we'll do a lot of map reduces and secondary indexes across a large set of data and it was just, we weren't looking at it the right way and I think it was a lesson learned. Um, I think it, it really, you know, it, it teaches a lesson which is you need to make sure you're you're writing data to the database you've picked in the right way. Um, so I think, yeah, React's great. I think it's great for a ton of use cases. Um, but, you know, at this point, we sort of already switched, <laughs> if that makes sense. Yeah. Thank you for that, Chad. Now, we, uh, just to sort of uh, continue on, on that note, we have a very interesting uh, question from the React side of the fence uh, and one of the members of the audience asking, have you tried the new React 2.0, which has, in fact, been released two days ago? <laughs> uh, well, not in the last two days, but um, I've played around with Rick a lot in the last year. So, um, no, it's got some amazing stuff, and I think um, I'm the. I mean, a lot of those guys are friends of mine at at Basho, and so I have. I mean, I feel like it's become a really robust database, and so ironically, I still recommend it. I think um, what I what we found with Whisper was we really just need a lot of different databases for a lot of different needs. We use. Um, uh, you know, Elastic for its search capabilities. We use um, a key value store for what we need a key value store for. We use, we still use MySQL because it's great for a lot of administrative stuff that's not getting a lot of traffic. Um, it's just simple to get stuff done in. Um, and so, you know, you just pick the right tool. And I think what we realize is there's a point where when you're starting out, you just want one database because you don't want to deal with all the hassle of all these different databases. There's a point where you get big enough where adding one more isn't that much of an operational hassle relative to all the other operational hassles you have. So um, you pick the right tool for the job. Thank you for commenting on that, Chad. And uh, the problem we're having is that we're receiving more questions than, than we can answer, and uh, they're, they're actually piling up. But we'll try and uh, 
honor as many uh, queries as we can in the remaining time. One question for you, um, Vasilis is asking, in regards to the PG2 topic that you talked about and regarding the update cache process, is there time needed to synchronize or update the cache or does this happen in real time when needed to be served by the second node? That's a great question. So um, it's all happening in real time. Uh, we don't wait for it to be updated and, and so there obviously could be in, you know, inconsistencies. Um, I think for the type of application we have it doesn't really matter. So for instance there are ways to minimize that. Uh, you can turn on sticky sessions and make sure that in general a user that comes into the system is going to stay on the same server. So their view of the world is there's a bit of like relativity to it but their view of the world is going to be consistent uh, with what they see and so if it's a second later or whatever it doesn't really matter. Um, yeah, so I, that's sort of, you know, we take a very loose approach to replication in that sense because there's not a huge cost. You know, if it was financial data, you might want to think differently about how you're caching it, but I think it, in this case it's okay. Thank you for that. Uh, another question uh, is basically asking, uh, you know, in the Whisper application, is it true that Erlang is used for distributed caching only, and why don't you use a generic cache server instead? Um, well, that's a good question. I think, um, you know, our particular our needs have evolved uh, over time, and so we've sort of, um, you know, developed the caches that we needed um, as um, the service has evolved. Um, there are a couple of things that I didn't go into in terms of of why we want to have caches per server. Um, you know, it's the um, the way that we actually move things around and and we um, in our popular feeds is depending on a, on a sort of algorithm that that um, uh, updates the relative position based on a bunch of factors and there's some business logic there that it's easier if that's being done on all the individual servers than it is if we have one master doing that and we're kind of hoping that things running and you know kind of updating it for everybody we have it just sort of done in in place. Um, one of the, the sort of design philosophies of Erlang is um, if there's a way to parallelize something it's generally better because if that one thing breaks it doesn't affect anyone else and so um, actually doing it this way makes it very very robust so if you imagine let's say we have one process doing the position changes of our popular feed and that dies now no one's seeing an updated feed until we figure out what's going on whereas if there's a bug in some little area of uh, you know our popular algorithm that's only going to affect the person that it crashed on um, so uh, that's a that's sort of a fundamental Erlang philosophy that that helps you frame problems differently and so that's probably um, you know the best simple reason why we did it that way thank you Chad uh, now just to say that we're receiving questions faster than we're answering them so what I'd like to say to everyone in, in the audience is that we will pass all your questions to Chad and we'll ask him to answer them and obviously then send the answers to uh, the uh, persons asking the questions. So just to sort of move on and answer as uh, many questions as we can in the remaining couple of minutes. Uh, Chad, how did you come to the decision and why did you use ETS instead of simple DB for caching? Um, that's a good question. Um... I think, you know, the, the one thing that, about ads that I like so much is just how insanely fast it is. Um, we did a little Erlang uh, LA meetup last week or two weeks ago, and we all talked about our um, configuration management tools that we use. And, you know, we use uh, uh, an ads table to cache all of our configuration changes that are in, that are configuration that's stored in Zookeeper. And the runtime performance is just insane. It's so fast. And so, you know, I think at the time it felt like um, that was a, a really nice um, solution because it's just incredibly fast to read from at. So if once you've updated that little in-memory cache, I can you know blaze out uh, a JSON response on our on Mochi Web um, to that. You know, it's just it's just fast and reliable. And so I don't know. We didn't really look at simple DB. So yeah. Thanks for that. Um, there's an observation that's come in from uh, one of our um, audience, uh, Eunice. Eunice is basically saying uh, in one of your slides you mentioned uh, you know the call ETS lookup slash two and he's basically saying that this particular call can be very problematic unless it's used synchronously. 
But if that's the case, if you're using it synchronously, you're losing ETS concurrency. Would you share any views on that observation? Um, you know what? I <laughs> that's a really good point. I actually think that we might have changed that since this the slide was updated. In other words, I can actually look at the code and and get back to you. So um, I feel like we're using uh, fun to we're doing a fun to MS query now where we're we're, we're generating a um, um, a match spec and we're running that. So I think we've actually changed that query. So the you know. Conceptually, the code that I showed is it, it makes sense, but I think the actual code we're using in terms of performance is a little bit different. So that's a very astute observation. Thanks for that, Chad. Uh, given the time remaining, we'll try and answer two to three more questions max. So just quickly to sort of um, go through these particular questions, uh, here's one that I'm uh, fond of uh, myself because in Erlang Solutions, we're big fans of Elixir. So one of our audience are asking, uh, do you think that you will use Elixir for development, partly or fully, going forward? Yeah, so uh, great question. And in fact, we're using it a lot. Um, we um, have built a lot of ancillary services in Elixir. It's, um, they, for instance, we have a very, very large um, uh, XML sitemap for all the content that uh, we have um, that we've created in the last couple of years. So the system that builds that is an Elixir. Um, we also have a runtime, like a real-time uh, statistics platform that's similar to something like Google Analytics or Mixpanel, and that is all written in Elixir and handles um, literally billions of events a day. Um, and so we're very, very happy with Elixir. I would say. Um, I don't think it'll necessarily replace all of our Erlang codes, but I think that it's um, it's going to have a place in in the in the um, in the system for sure. Fantastic, thank you, Chad. Uh, now, just one further question, I'd like you to answer. Uh, one of our audience are asking: uh, Did you consider an architecture using uh, something like RabbitMQ as the message queue? Yeah, so um, that's a good question. I think. Um, we actually do use Rabbit for a couple of things that are a little bit less real time. Like so, uh, some uh, push notifications are queued up in Rabbit. Um, we have a, um, a sort of background process system that we we sort of built an Erlang version of of um, Rescue, which is the the GitHub created framework in Ruby, and um, that currently is using Redis as its back end, and that's why we have Redis in the platform for the most part. Um, and we're going to replace that with Rabbit. So we do like Rabbit. Um, I think the volume of updates, um, I'm sure Rabbit could handle it, but I think sort of the way, I feel like it would be a bit of a hassle to go through Rabbit when you've already got this clustered set of Erlang servers. So. Um, yeah. I think that makes uh, perfect sense. Now, Chad, given that we have about a minute or two left, um, I'd like to ask you one final question, which I think is the perfect question to finish with. How do you see Whisper evolving, and how do you see your use of Erlang evolving you know, in the future? Yeah, it's a great question. I mean, I think um, you know, we definitely are not uh, religious about Erlang. We're using a lot of Python for data science. Um, and I think that will continue. Um, I see Erlang as glue for us. I see us using Elixir in places, a lot of Python for analysis. Um, I see, um, I mean, I think we're trying to keep core APIs, you know, um, in either Erlang or Elixir just because um, we know how to maintain and, and support those. Um, but I think, you know, um, as the platform evolves, for instance, we're, we're releasing a dev API. Um, and there's, it's in limited beta right now, but it's going to be out um, soon. And um, that's uh, in written in Elixir. And I think so. You know, we're we're sort of saying, hey, let's try Elixir for this. This could be a good fit. So it's you know easy to prototype, et cetera. So I think it'll always be core. But I think you know if we say, hey, we need to do some some data science, we'll use we might use Python for that. Fantastic. Thank you, Chad. Uh, and as we like to say, you know, use the best tool for the job. So. Uh, Chad, I'd like to thank you for a very inspiring talk um, about the Whisper application. I'm sure our audience uh, will join me uh, in that. 
Many thanks to all of you who have joined us for the webinar. I'd just like to thank everyone for all the questions you've sent, uh, and we promise to answer all of them uh, following the webinar itself. It's just the time uh, has sort of run out, of, run out on us on this particular occasion. Now, please join us again for our next monthly webinar uh, in October. And uh, following today, we will be sending you a short survey to make sure that we capture your feedback of today's webinar. Please also note that the recording of the webinar and the presentation that was we'll shared today will also be available for you to collect on Erlang Solutions' corporate website at www.erlang-solutions.com. Thank you, Chad. Thank you, everyone. And thank you once again. And we look forward to seeing you on our next webinar. Thanks, Martin. Appreciate it.